I'll just let you know this morning, my sermon's going to be a little bit different than, than normal. I'm going to be kind of all over the place uh, this morning, talking about a lot of different scriptures. You want to go ahead and open up to Acts chapter 20, uh, you can do that. But we've been, going through, uh, we've been going through the Gospels on Sunday mornings, and we've been talking about following the footsteps of Jesus, and we've been going through the chronological order of the life of Jesus and seeing the things that Jesus did, seeing the things that Jesus taught so that uh, we would be able able to emulate those things and so we too would have the mind of Christ and that we would be doing the very things that Jesus did. And so when we look at that, one of the things that we've noticed here on Sunday mornings, and I've mentioned this quite a lot, talked about it quite a lot, that we see Jesus on the Sabbath going into the synagogue and worshiping. And even in our Sunday school time, we've been talking about Jesus, talked about that just last week, Jesus going into the synagogue on the Sabbath and worshiping. And so we have to ask ourselves the question, maybe it's something you've thought about before, maybe it's something you've kind of scratched your head over, maybe it's something that you've been confronted about, maybe it's never even crossed your mind. But this morning we're going to answer the questions, why do Christians worship on Sundays? Amen. Why don't we worship on the Sabbath day, which is the seventh day, which is Saturday? Why rather do we worship on Sundays? And so when we begin to think about that, we begin to answer that question this morning. I want you to keep that in mind. You know, I've been asked that personally several times throughout uh, the course of my ministry. I've been, uh, I, I've had family members who just not too long ago, they were confronted uh, by some folks. I don't even know where they're coming from, but they said, you know, you, you guys are worshiping a false God. You're worshiping a pagan God because you're not worshiping on Saturdays. You're worshiping on Sundays as well. So we need to look at this and we need to look at it seriously and see, well, why and answer that question, why do we worship uh, on Sundays? Why do we go to church on Sundays? Now I want you to understand when I use that word worship, I use that word worship loosely because sometimes we come to church on Sunday and not worship, amen, but actually as a Christian, we're to worship every single day, 24 hours a day, amen. We're to be 24 7 worshipers, not just when we come to church. So why do Christians go to church or why should Christians go to church on Sunday? And that's the question uh, for today. Now, first of all, before we really get into that, not everybody agrees with that. Most Christians believe that. Most Christians agree with that. But not everybody agrees with that. There's some Messianic Jews that they worship on uh, Saturdays and Seven-day Adventists are probably the most popular. They worship on Saturdays and they believe in in fact, it's appalling to them to worship any other day of the week. They believe that Saturday is the day that is set aside uh, for the day of worship and to do anything else is to actually break the law of God. And so that's a question that we need to ask ourselves is are we breaking the law of God by worshiping or having church on Sunday rather than Saturday? And so when we ask that question, we need to first of all look at a couple of things. I want you to understand that seven-day Adventists in most, not, not all, but most Messianic Jews, they don't believe that they're saved by the keeping of the law. They believe that they're saved by putting their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ. But we need to be leery when people overemphasize the law and put more emphasis upon the law than they put upon grace and they put upon the actual person of Jesus Christ. You know, Paul dealt with this a lot uh, during his ministry. Paul would go into an area, he would preach the gospel of grace, he would preach the gospel of putting your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. In fact, Paul said in the book of Galatia, he said in the first chapter, he said, if I or an angel above preaches to you a gospel contrary to that which you've already heard, let them be accursed. Amen. So if anybody adds the keeping of the law to putting your faith and trust in the grace of Jesus, Jesus Christ, then what we need to understand is that is not a true gospel. That is not a true faith. And we need to remember that. We need to keep that in mind as we begin to understand in Galatians chapter 1 verse 6 through 7, the apostle Paul wrote this. He said, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. It's not even the correct gospel if you're trying to uh, go in accordance to works 
go in accordance to keeping the law. Uh, if, if, if law plus Jesus doesn't work. Amen. It is only Jesus. And so anything plus Jesus is a different gospel. And we need to keep that in mind. He says, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Now we need to understand that. Well, what in the world does that have to do with worshiping on any particular day of the week? Paul also told the church of Galatia, he told them in uh, chapter 4, verses 9 through 11, he said, but uh, now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by by God, how is it that you have turned back again to a weak and worthless elemental things, weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again? Trying to keep the law it is then becoming enslaved to those things. It doesn't mean that we don't keep the moral law. It doesn't mean it's okay to go out there and murder and pillage and rape and all of those things. Certainly it is not. Not, and God gave us the law. In fact, the Bible tells us the law is good, right? The law lets us know what the standard is, but we don't allow that law to oppress us. We pursue a godly life. We pursue a holy life, but we understand that it is only by grace through faith in Jesus Christ that we are saved. And then he goes on to say, you observe days and months and season and years for... Uh, I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in vain. And so when we begin to make it about certain days, and when we begin to make it about doing certain tasks, and we begin to make it a checklist of do's and don'ts and rights and wrongs, rather than pursuing the person of Jesus Christ, you know, as Jesus said, if you love me, you're going to obey me. I obey the person of Jesus Christ, not because I have a checklist to mark off of do's and don'ts and rights and wrongs, but because I love Jesus. Amen. I love Him and I want to pursue Him. I want to seek Him out and be obedient in every area of my life. Why? Because I love Him. Now something else that we need to understand is that God did tell us, in fact one of the commandments that we find in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8 is to remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. Amen. Remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. That is a commandment of God. And so, you know, there's some out there that will teach, well, the Sabbath's been done away with, but you don't find that teaching anywhere in the Bible. Say, well, the law's been done away with. Well, it's, is it okay now to go commit adultery? Is it okay to go murder? Is it okay to lie and, and steal and do all of those things and covet? Of course not. In fact, we find teachings from Jesus himself about those very truths. And so we need to recognize that the law certainly hasn't been done away with, but we're not saved by the law. In fact, nobody's ever been saved by the law. I mean, no, there's not a single person, not even Abraham, right? It was by faith that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. But the law of God does say, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy and then he also goes so far as to say in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11, he said, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea that is in them and rested when? On the seventh day. He rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made, the, made it holy holy. So when is the Sabbath day? According to the law of God, according to the word of God, it is extraordinarily clear that God worked for six days and on the seventh day he rested. Well, what is the seventh day? You could look at a calendar to this day and you'll realize that the week ends on the seventh day. That seventh day is not Sunday. That seventh day is Saturday, the first day of the week, is Sunday. 
And so as we look at that, the Word of God makes it very, very clear that the Sabbath is on a Saturday, the seventh day of the week. It has not changed. It has not been replaced by a different day. God never moved the Sabbath to the first day of the week. That has never been done. So again, well then why in the world do we worship on Sundays rather than Saturdays on the first day of the week rather than on the seventh day of the week? Are we guilty of breaking the very law of God? God by gathering together in worship on the first day of the week, Sunday, rather than on the seventh day of the week. Now, some would argue, you know, you do see Jesus in the Gospels. You see him often. You see him many, many times. Jesus in the Gospels, where the Bible very specifically says that Jesus on the Sabbath day is going into the synagogue and he's teaching and he's doing all kinds of different things. Even when you turn into the book of Acts, the very early church in the book of Acts, for instance, you find Peter and John in Acts chapter 3, and what are they doing? They're going into the temple itself. And so as they're going into the temple, they're continuing to follow those Jewish customs. They're continuing to follow those Jewish ways. And then as you progress, you see the Apostle Paul many times, several times that he's going into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. But something that we need to understand and we need to make certain that we know and we, we, we grasp this is that Jesus, as he was going into the Sabbath, uh, into the synagogue rather on the Sabbath day, the majority, the great majority of all four of the Gospels was written prior to the New Covenant. Amen. Prior to the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the resurrection is going to become very important here in a moment as we continue to look at this. As we look at those early Christians that are going into the temple, you know, is that temple important? You know, we're reminded of the, uh, of the time when the, the disciples of Jesus were there with Jesus and they were ooing and aahing over the temple. And of course, the temple was important. The temple was established by God, but the temple played its part and God took the temple out of the way. And as they were there ooing and aahing over the temple, Jesus told the disciples there's going to come a day when not one stone is going to remain upon the other. And guess what? In AD 70, the Roman Empire went in, the Roman army went in there and absolutely leveled the temple and did away with the temple and there hasn't been a temple the, uh, since then. And if we do start to see a temple being rebuilt over there in Jerusalem, well then get ready because a trumpet's about to blow. Amen. It's about to be, it's about to be that time where we're going to see uh, those things. In fact, I, see, I believe uh, we're seeing prophecy unfold before our very eyes uh, right here, right now, today. Every time we turn the news on, especially this week, of some of the things that, uh, that, that we have uh, going on. But when Paul went into the, the synagogue on the Sabbath day, what was he doing? He was preaching about the resurrected Jesus. Amen. He was going there with, for a very specific purpose, a very specific intent of telling people about Jesus. And most of the time, it got him in trouble. <laughs> Amen. Most of the time he, he would get uh, either a riot uh, would take place or they would stone him or throw him in jail or something would take place. And most of the time it was because he was going into those synagogues on the Sabbath day and preaching about the resurrected Jesus Christ. And so as we look at that and we recognize that here within the word of God, there is a very reason of why all of these things were taking place. But I want you to understand the early church the early church guess what they were all Jews. Every single one of them were Jews. 100% of them in that early church were Jews. It wasn't until Acts chapter 10 where Peter went to Cornelius' house and Peter preached the gospel to Cornelius and then the Holy Spirit of God came and Cornelius was saved and his whole household was saved and then God called Paul to go into all of the nations and preach the gospel 
to all of the Gentiles. And then there started to be a whole lot more Gentiles that were getting saved than Jews who were saved. And the Jews were getting further and further and further away from Christianity. And the Gentiles were grabbing more and more and more a hold of Christianity. And then finally God did away with the temple and eventually uh, the, the whole aspect of the Judaism eventually then faded off of the scene. And so as you get later in, and we see this in the Word of God, and we're going to see it uh, here today as we look at these scriptures and again answer the question, why do we worship on Sundays or why do we go to church on Sundays rather than Saturdays? And so when we look at this and we begin to understand, first of all, we need to establish a precedent. There is a calling within the Word of God that we need to assemble. Amen? In fact, the Bible is extraordinarily clear about the fact that we need to assemble. In fact, Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, he said, where two or more gathered in my name, gathered, that means assembled, gathered together in the name of Jesus Christ. In other words, for the specific purpose of seeking him and worshiping him, not just gathered together to, you know, watch, watch TV or gathered together to play cards or gathered together to do whatever, but we're gathered together in the name of Jesus for the specific purpose of seeking Seeking Jesus, Jesus said, I will be in their midst. Of course, we all know Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. You've heard it from every Baptist preacher a lot, especially lately since COVID, amen. Do not forsake the gathering of one another or the assembling of one another as is the custom of some. And so the, the Bible's clear about the fact that we are to assemble, that Christians are to as assemble together. And I know not everybody can. You know, I've heard pastors say, there's no way I'm going to uh, allow our church to live stream our, our services on Facebook because they'll just use that as an excuse not to come. And some people do use that as an excuse not to come. But I praise God we have the technology because there's some folks that can't come. They'd love to come, but they physically cannot come. And praise God that that has opened the door to allow them to be able to participate. Amen? Now, if others abuse it, it's like anything else in the world. Some folks are going to abuse it. Amen? But we are called, if you can be here, we are called to assemble together and be together and not forsake that as the Word of God very clearly tells us. And so not only that, we find in the Word of God as well that not only we're called to assemble together, you know the Bible, there, there's a lot of instructions all throughout the New Testament. There's a great deal of instructions of all of the things that we need to be doing while we're assembled. So in other words, you're, you're called to assemble, you're required to assemble, you're expected to assemble, assemble, and then God gives us all of these instructions of all of these things that we're supposed to be doing while we're assembled. In fact, we're supposed to be singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs. Amen? We're supposed to be reading the Word of God. We're supposed to be teaching the Word of God. We're supposed to be preaching uh, the Word of God. We're supposed to be saying amen together. Amen? Amen? Bible tells us that. <laughs> and so there's a lot of instructions within the Word of God of things that we need to be doing while we're assembled together. In fact, in 1 Timothy, we find the reason that the very reason that the Apostle Paul wrote the book of 1 Timothy to Timothy, Timothy, who, by the way, was a pastor, a pastor of the church of Ephesus. We find in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, the Apostle Paul says, I write these things to you hoping to come to you before long. And so Paul is about to tell him, this is the very reason I'm writing to you. This is the very purpose of this epistle. It's the very purpose of this letter that I am writing to you that we now know today as 1 Timothy he says, but in case I am delayed, I write. So here's the reason I write. He flat out says, he says, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. 
instructions of how we are to conduct ourselves while we're assembled together. So obviously that's important, right? Obviously it's an important thing and we need to take that seriously. I know there's some, you know, when I look at, uh, uh, at older folks that have been raised in the church their whole life and they were faithful, and it just breaks their heart when they get to a physical place in life when they can't come. They literally grieve over that. And we as a church need to continue to minister to them. Amen? Because they were faithful and we need to continue to be faithful to, to them. And they would be here if they could, but they can't. And so now as we look at this and begin to understand, it's important that we assemble. There's instructions that we are to assemble, but do you know nowhere in the New Testament, nowhere in the New Testament is there a command that says, thou shalt gather on the seventh day of the week, or thou shalt gather on the first day of the week. There's not a command in the Bible anywhere, in the New Testament anywhere, or the Old Testament, it says this is the particular day of the week that you are supposed to gather. So once again, so far, I have been very good at not answering the question of why should we worship on Sundays, right? But I'm going to get to that. I'm going to get to that point. Why do we worship on Sundays? Well, the first, the, the most simple answer is because we've always done it. Amen? Amen? Isn't that the Baptist answer? We've always done it that way. That's the way we've always done it. In fact, when I say we've always done it that way, I literally mean we've always done it that way. <laughs> Amen. We've always met the Christians have always gathered together on Sundays for a day of worship. Now, some people that are opposed to worshiping on Sundays and say that you're supposed to worship on Saturdays, they actually say, no, somewhere around 400 A.D., the Roman Catholics, they got together and they changed the date from Saturday to Sunday, and this is why they did it. But I want you to understand, first of all, there is no history historical record of that ever taking place ever that also doesn't answer the question of why the eastern orthodox churches who are by the way separate from the roman catholics also worship on sundays and what about coptic christians maybe we haven't really heard of coptic christians but Coptic Christians claim to be the oldest Christian group on the face of the earth. In fact, they themselves claim that it was the Apostle Mark that went over into the Middle East. Most of the Coptic, uh, Coptic Christians are in Egypt today, and there's a lot of them over there, by the way. And they claim that it was the Apostle Mark himself who started the group of Coptic Christians. And guess what? They have always met on Sunday. Sundays. So when I say that the church has always met on Sundays, I literally mean it has always met on Sunday. That has always been the tradition of the church. In fact, we also find in a, a, a writing uh, from Ignatius. Ignatius was one of the early church uh, uh, the fathers and he was writing to the Meganese church and as he was writing a letter to the Meganese church you know what he actually spelled it out there there is a distinction between the sabbath and the first day of the week the seventh day of the week and the first day of the week which he had a very specific name for that first day of the week that we'll talk about here in just a minute and so as we look at that in one in the 100s the very early 100s AD, very, very early on, not that far after the original apostles passed away, here was Ignatius saying, Christians, go to church on the first day of the week. That's what they do. So all the way back, just about from the very beginning, so when I say that's what we've always done, well, that's what we've always done. Now, now, you know, we don't go by tradition. We're not led by tradition. We're not led by that's just what we've always done. But sometimes there's a reason that we do what we've always done. 
Amen? So whereas we're not led by tradition, we're led by the Word of God. Now, Brother Rusty, you already said that there's no commandment in the Bible and there's no instructions anywhere in the Bible that we're supposed to gather together on Sundays, but we still do find in the Word of God a church gathering on Sundays. Amen? So when I say that's what we've always done, that's what we've always done, and we find it right here within the Word of God. Now again, the Sabbath hasn't been done away with. You don't find that anywhere in the Word of God. The Sabbath has not been done away with, but what is the Sabbath? It's the day of rest. Amen? It's the day of rest. And Jesus Himself said that... that, that, uh, The Sabbath is for man. In other words, it's God's gift to humanity to say, hey, take a break. (laughs) Rest. You need your rest. And that's God's gift to man. Now, the, the, the Jews, they took it, they twisted and turned it, tried to put all kinds of extra laws on there. But when we look in the Word of God, we do find that the early church meeting on the first day of the week. And so as they met on the first day of the week, but first of all, if you're in, in, in Acts chapter 20, stay there. No, I told you that a long time ago, but I'm going to get there uh, here in just a minute. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, the apostle Paul told the church, told the church of Corinth to take up an offering. When did he tell them to take up that offering? On the first day of the week. Well, what would be the reason of taking up an offering specifically on the first day of the week? Well, that's the day apparently they gathered. Amen? Which is Sunday. Then in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 12, Paul mentions that offering again. And you know, this time he calls it a service. He calls that offering a service. Uh, Yes, we can serve. We don't just serve God on Sundays. We can serve God and we should serve God. We're called to serve God every day of the week, but it just so happened to be a Sunday. Amen? A day in which they were gathered. But then when we turn our Bibles to Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, we find, I believe, probably one of the most clear passages of scriptures within the Bible It says there on verse 7, on the first day of the week. Here it is. The first day of the week. And what were they doing on the first day of the week? When we were gathered. When we were gathered. When we were assembled. When we were gathered together to do what? To break bread. So what were they doing? They were breaking bread. And then not only were they breaking bread... It says there that Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. You think I'm long-winded. Amen. He preached till midnight. In fact, he preached so long, somebody fell asleep, fell out of a window. Amen. And a a miracle needed to take place as a result of it. But what were they doing? They were breaking bread. Well, first of all, they were gathered Not only were they gathered, they were breaking bread. Gathered means assembled, by the way. They were assembled. The Bible tells us not to forsake the assembling of one another. It was the first day of the week. They were gathered. They were assembled. They were breaking bread. And the Apostle Paul was giving giving a message. Which sounds a whole lot like Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. It says where they were devoting themselves continually to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. So what the New Testament church was doing in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 at their very beginning sounds a whole lot like what they were doing on the first day of the week in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. Amen? Then we turn to Revelation chapter 1. And in Revelation chapter 1, I believe we find probably the most compelling text of Scripture. Now remember Ignatius, he was in the early 100s A.D., 
Which is important to understand because the book of Revelation was written by the Apostle John right around 90 A.D. So not that far ahead of when Ignatius wrote to the Magnes Church about them gathering. On a very specific worded day, which was the first day of the week. So in Revelation chapter 1, here it is that we find the Apostle Paul. We find him in verse 9, and the Bible says, I, brother, I, I your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation, the kingdom, and pre, uh, perseverance, which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So he's on this island called Patmos, this little bitty island out in the middle of the Aegean Sea, banished to this island because of the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus. He was being punished, put on this island, isolated from the rest of society because he was preaching the gospel. But look what he says in verse 10. I was in the Spirit... On the Lord's day. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. What is that specific word that Ignatius used to say that it was the day in which Christians gathered? He said, yes, it's the first day of the week, but it is the Lord's day. It's the Lord's day. Well, what makes it the Lord's day? Jesus said in Mark chapter 20, verse 25, He said that, that, that He's the Lord over the Sabbath. Is that the Lord's day? Well, the fact is, Jesus is Lord over every day. Amen? But very specifically, what is the specific Lord's day? Lord's day is the first day of the week. Well, what makes the Lord's Day the first day of the week? Because that is the very day in which Jesus resurrected from the grave. Amen? It is the day in which Jesus resurrected from the grave that we as Christians gather, assemble together for the purpose of celebrating, hey, we are who we are because Jesus resurrected from the grave. Paul said we, above all people, would be the most to be pitied if Jesus wasn't really resurrected from the grave. But He did. And so we gather together for many reasons, but we gather together as a celebration and a recognition that this is the Lord's day, the day we recognize the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. So as we look at this, Jesus did say, hey, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. And we should keep the Sabbath, and we should keep it holy, and we should keep it as what it was intended for, and that's a day of rest. Amen? And we should keep the Lord's day just like Christians have always done from the very beginning, even in the New Testament, as the day that we gather together, assemble together, do it the way God tells us to do it in His Word, that we do it for the purpose that this is the Lord's day. This is a special day. Amen? Every day we worship. Every day we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Every day we celebrate our salvation, or we should. Every day we serve. We should. But we should also set aside a very special day of the week, the Lord's Day, That day that even John, 
No, we can't call that an assembly because he doesn't tell us anybody else was there. And probably the reason he doesn't tell us anybody was there is because remember he was banished, punished for preaching the gospel and he was intentionally by the Roman government separated from everybody. So no, everybody else wasn't there. But you know what? He still was in the spirit. In other words, he was worshiping on the Lord's day. He still, even though he was all by himself on this island, being punished for the gospel, he still chose to set that day aside and worship. Amen? And we should too. But we don't need to be legalistic. Don't need to make it a checklist of the week. Done that. Fulfilled my religious duties, my religious obligations. No, we ought to have the desire to assemble together with other Christians. If we can. To worship on the Lord's day. Most likely, if you're not worshiping on the Lord's day, you're probably not going to be worshiping any other day. Amen? And that's just fact. Make it a point. Why do we worship? To see the biblical precedent of it, which is the most important thing. It is the Lord's day. And that's what we do as Christians. That's what we've always done as Christians. And that's what we should always do as Christians. Amen? I know sometimes you just can't be here. But if you can be here, you need to be here. Amen? And you need to value that within your life. Right now, ask our praise team to come on up. And as they come up, Keith and Sister Kim, they come up this morning. I know I'm preaching to the choir this morning. I recognize that. You know, isn't it so easy to get distracted, lose focus? I could be doing a thousand other things. It's a beautiful day out there. Man, that cold front came through. It's nice. Cruising the coast is going on this week. Everybody said amen. Amen. So it's like the most important event of the year. But not really. Worshiping Jesus is the most important event of the year. Amen. far outweighs anything and everything else. So this morning I ask you to stand and as you stand, first of all, are you saved? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Because if you don't, you can't celebrate the Lord's Day because Jesus is not yet your Lord. But you have an opportunity today to come to know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Would you come? What do I have to do? All you have to do is very simple. You repent of your sins. What does that mean? Turn away from those sins, but more importantly, turn to Jesus. Because only He can keep you from those sins and forgive you of those sins. Ask Him to forgive you of those sins. Invite Him into your life to be your Lord and Savior. It's very simple. And you do it by faith. Believing that when you ask, He's going to hear and He's going to answer. If you've done that or you would like to do that this morning, would you come? Talk to me about that. Amen. You come as God so leads. Next Sunday, we're going to have baptism. 
to be baptized. Actually, several folks next Sunday. I'm excited about it. Maybe you're here today and you'd like to be baptized. You've never been baptized. You've already accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you haven't been baptized. Would you come? Come down this morning. Tell us you want to be baptized. We'll be more than happy to do so if you're saved. Amen. You come as God so leads. Anything else on your heart? You mind this morning you come? I'll be happy to pray for you. This altar is open. You come as God leads.